Good morning. Well, we got an odd title maybe, but we'll see how we fare with it. I don't know about you, but have you ever had one of those really socially awkward moments? I've had quite a few in my lifetime. There's one in particular that was really memorable for me. When I was 21, I moved back to my hometown, and I hadn't seen most of my friends in several years. I'd been living overseas. And when I got home, I went into this archaic thing that no longer exists called Blockbuster. Those of you that are younger can Google it and figure it out later. I went in there and I ran into one of my friends from high school and she was working there. And I remember opening my mouth and immediately sticking my foot in. I didn't know how far I was going to stick it in. I'm pretty sure I got the whole leg in there as well as the foot. And I said to her, when's the baby due? Yeah, that was pretty awkward. I could try and defend it and say, you know, she had changed proportion in just one area only in the last three years since I'd seen her, but really, that's not okay. I'm naturally an introverted person. I know a lot of people are baffled by that. As a young child, I didn't like talking to strangers. I didn't like talking to other people. I was a mama's boy through and through. I was with my family and my close friends, and that was about it. All of my extroverted behavior is what you might call learned behavior. It was a decision that I made that I wanted to be an extroverted person. I wanted to be able to have conversations with others. I feel like in 2020, my social skills have regressed. I don't know if you feel the same way. I don't know if a lot of you are digital natives or if you're not a digital native, if maybe you've taken to texting and communicating through social media like a duck to water. Maybe that's your preferred mode of communication. Maybe some of you are a different kind of duck that you prefer that face-to-face -face conversation. None of those are my strong suits. <laughs> it's all learned behavior for me. I think that's one of the reasons I've always enjoyed the outdoors. It's why, as a kid, I gravitated towards sports, because you didn't have to do a lot of talking to have fun and to have a little bit of relationship with people. Even before I was a Christian, even before I was an atheist, because I was an atheist before I was a Christian, I've always felt connected to someone or something when I'm alone in nature. It's one of those places where I just feel connected to God. Sometimes I've thought of what it would be like to be a hermit, to live without people. I'm pretty sure I could do that. I'm pretty sure I could disappear into the woods and be perfectly happy without people. But there's a reason that I don't. If I were to pick a place to disappear, it would be the California Redwoods, the Sequoia National Forest. Has anybody ever been there before? It's amazing, isn't it? It's truly breathtaking when you step foot inside that forest for the first time. The first time I visited the actual Redwood Forest, which is just north of Trinidad, California, was when I got married on my honeymoon. My wife and I are odd ducks. We don't like being in front of people to the point where when we got married, we said, we're not going to have a big wedding. We're not getting up on a stage in front of people. We don't even want to do it in front of our families. So we eloped, if you can call it that, because we planned it and we told everybody. And we got married in a hot air balloon above Napa Valley, California at sunrise. It was amazing. I highly recommend eloping to any of you young people out there. Don't spend the money on the wedding. Take like a two or three week honeymoon and go explore because that's what we did. And we spent 
three weeks wandering around California, Oregon, and Washington, just seeing what was there. Looking back at our wedding video, it's actually kind of humorous. We didn't realize it until we played it at a reception we had for our friends. I don't know if you realize how loud those flamethrowers are in those balloons. So there's my wife and I, the preacher and his wife, and the balloon pilot, and he's right in the back of the video in the middle between everybody, and he had this nice pit stain going on. You know, he was sweaty that day. None of this was on our horizon whatsoever. And every few minutes you would hear, stand by, and then the service would continue. Back to the Redwoods, though. For those of you that have been there, you know what I'm talking about. When you set foot inside that forest, the trees are just enormous. They tower above you, but it isn't just the height of them. It isn't just how big around they are. It's also the age of the trees. A lot of the massive Redwoods that you read about are believed to be between 800 and 3,000, yes, 1,000 years old. That means that some of these trees are estimated to have begun growing before Jesus was even born. That's humbling, isn't it? This is a picture of a redwood. You don't really get the perspective of just how huge it is. My wife's just cropped out of the picture. You know, that whole not liking being in front of people, it strikes again. (laughs) Here's some statistics for those of you that have never seen a redwood in person. The tallest redwood I've been able to find is one called the Juggernaut. And it's 460 feet tall. Isn't that mind-boggling? Somehow that's listed as the eighth tallest tree in the world. I have as yet to find anything listed that's taller, so I'm not quite sure where their classification system comes from. There's another one called General Sherman that's only 270 feet tall, but it's 36 and a half feet thick. Diameter, not circumference. If you go with circumference, that's something like 100 feet, which is insane for a tree. And you start digging into the weight, that 6,000 ton, does anybody have off the top of their head what the largest living creature, the blue whale, weighs? In adult form, it's between two and 300 tons. What's interesting is when you start looking at the weight of these redwood trees, the trunk alone is five and a half thousand tons. The root system is a measly 375 tons. They're estimated to have like 5,000 tons of leaves. I don't want to be the guy who has to rake that. (laughs) I'm going to ask you to bear with me. There's a reason that I'm talking about redwoods. And it's because Jesus does a style of teaching where he tells you about something. And then he says this is like that. And that's why I'm talking about redwoods today, because there's a lot wrapped up in redwoods that I think has a message for us that connects with the passage that Phil read. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about redwoods. Their root systems are really interesting. They do not go deep. They only go about six feet underground, and they just spread out. That's... 375 tons to hold up way over 5,000 tons, 6,000 tons almost. The only way that a root system can support the weight of a redwood tree to get that high, to get that big, is when it's growing with other redwoods. Because their root systems intertwine. They even fuse together in some places. And it's because the redwood trees were designed, they were built for community. They were designed to be together. You will never, ever see a lone redwood achieve any of those statistics that we looked at. Because a storm comes along and the root system of just that tree itself can't support it through those storms. 
It's just not going to happen. I think it's important for us to look at the Redwoods and recognize that the same is true of us as Christians. We are meant to live in community. We are meant to live with one another. And that's what the passage is talking about in 1 Corinthians. Except God doesn't use the imagery of redwood trees to get his point across, does he? He uses the image of our bodies. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. And so the body is not made up of one part, but many. We have a parable teaching here, don't we? This is like that. But instead of talking about trees, it's talking about our own bodies. And our own bodies are being compared to the body of Christ, which is the church. That means that not just the people that are surrounding you right now, though. That's not just talking about the people who are watching us at home, is it? It says all who were baptized. That means that we were designed to live in community with every single person who has taken on Christ in baptism. That's our family. That's our support system. That's what our roots are all interconnected through with one head above it, which is Christ. It's important to look at this passage because it acknowledges that we are meant to be diverse. We are meant to be different than one another. This isn't just talking about a skin-deep, shallow difference. This is more than gender diversity. This is more than cultural differences. It's about a skill and function difference. It's about a talent and ability difference between us and the person sitting next to us. It's more than someone being an introvert or an extrovert. It's more than a personality difference. It's something that's deep down at the core of who God created you to be. I love the imagery of the body that it uses here. It tickles my imagination. It tickles my funny bone. Youth ministers love this passage because they can make their youth group kids do stupid things. You make them have relay races where you handicap them essentially you have that guy who can no longer use his legs and then you have that other person who they can use their legs but you blindfold them so they can't see where they're running and it never fails to entertain but if we look at this passage and that's all we're looking at we're going to miss the things that are there the things that are important that we are meant to be Diverse, But the passage goes on and it gets more specific for us. This next passage is a little bit harder to read. Now, if the foot should say, because I am a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. Verse 15 is very, very important because you know what's happening here? Self-mutilation. One part of the body is looking at itself and it's looking at the other people in the body and saying, I don't look like them. I don't belong. And for that reason, they're choosing to cut themselves off from the rest of the body. I don't know if you've ever felt that way where you've looked around and feel that you don't measure up. You feel that you're not useful to the church. You say to yourself, 
I could never teach a class like Ashby does. You say to yourself, I could never get up on that stage and lead singing like Jack or like Steve or any of the other guys who get up here. I couldn't even get up and read a scripture like Phil did for us today. I couldn't lead communion. I don't think I could even teach a kid's class like Renda does, like Gwen do, like so many other people have put in the time in the village and in CBH and in TBH. What would we do, what we do to the church when we convince ourselves that we do not belong is we handicap the church. We remove a function that only you can offer. Just because you can't do what somebody else does does not mean that you do not have a purpose and an ability that is unique and essential. This passage reassures us and it tells us that our own securities don't make us less a part of the church. I know people who refuse to get baptized because they don't feel like they're good enough. I knew a guy who waited until he was in his 50s, had been going to church since he was a kid because he was convinced that he wasn't like the other people who went to church, that he didn't measure up. I have so many people come to me and they say, I could never do what you do. You're more spiritual. You're more holy. Your life is more together than mine could ever be. Baloney. I'm just as broken as every other person in this room. I'm just as sinful. I'm just as in need of God's grace as each and every one of you. God says that you do belong, that you are a part of his body. And it continues on. For if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. God speaks to our inadequacies here are feeling less than. It really hammers home the point of diversity, doesn't it? It's like he said it, and it was important enough to say it again. That's how serious God is about this. It tells you that God has a purpose for you, that you were built exactly the way you are because he wanted you to be built that way. It says that you are exactly where God wants you to be. And it's a truckload of baloney that you do not belong as part of the body. This isn't the only reason that people leave the church, though, is it? And it's not where this parable about the body stops. The eye cannot say to the hand... I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. This is the second form of self-mutilation of the church. It's rejecting others. I don't need you. You don't belong. It's telling somebody that church isn't the place for them. It's convincing someone else that God doesn't see value in them and neither do you. Most of the time, this isn't intentionally communicated, is it? This is unintentionally communicated most times. I can tell you stories from churches that I've been at and other youth ministers and ministers that I've talked to. I can tell you the story of a girl who came to a youth group and the only person that talked to her, even though she was invited by a friend who was moving to another country, I can tell you the story of this girl who went into a youth group and the only person that spoke to her was the youth minister. And after being there for six months, sticking it out, getting a cold shoulder from the church, 
And no one even engaging in, hey, who are you? What's your name? She saw inconsistency in what was taught from the scripture and what people were communicating. I can tell you stories of churches that have had little old ladies who live a block from the church building who have fallen down and broken something and they called the church office for help because they didn't have any family that would. And I can tell you the stories of preachers who said, I'm too busy preparing for my Wednesday class tonight. That makes me angry. Makes me sad. I can tell you stories of a girl who walked into a youth group and other girls realized that the boys liked her better. And they told her flat out, face to face, this isn't the place for you. You need to move on. Some of these are intentional. Some are unintentional. And I can tell you story after story after story But what I want you to do right now is I want you to stop and think. Who is somebody that you know right now who's hanging on to church by a thread? That's hanging on to the body by a thread? The challenge for you, whether it's them saying they don't belong or others unintentionally or intentionally communicating that they don't belong, what can you do to communicate how God really feels about them? That's the only homework I'm going to give you, but this passage doesn't end there. There's a lot more wrapped up in here. Verses 22 through 26 tell us how to deal with people that are different than us. They tell us how we're supposed to treat one another because this passage is written to believers. It's written to the church. And it's important to keep that in the back of your mind as you read this because that's who this is written to. Verse 22 says, On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. It talks about some adjectives in here to describe people who go to church. People that when you look at them, you might say to yourself, they're weak. What can they really do for me? Someone who maybe goes from one crisis to the next, and it seems like their life is constantly in crisis, that they're just spiritually not able to muster the strength that they need to walk the right path. To the point that, you know, some of those people, you're even afraid to ask them how they're doing, because you're going to find out way more about their life than you ever wanted to know, including all of their bodily functions. And you say, you know what, that's somebody who's weak and I'm just going to avoid that person. This is selfishness. It's self-serving to only love those that we get something from. To only love people when it costs us nothing. God makes it very clear in verse 22 that the weak are indispensable. God's strength is shown in our weakness, 2 Corinthians 12. They will know that you are mine by the way you love one another, John 13. Real love is this, that you lay down your life for your brother, John 15. Bear one uh, one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ, Galatians 6. Because at the end of the day, we're all weak, aren't we? Comparatively speaking, we have nothing to offer God when we actually look at who he is and what he is. But God's nature places a value on the weak because they are no less a perfect creation of his than the person who's strong. Without the weak within the church, there would be no reason to serve one another. There would be no opportunity to give within the body and for blessings to rain down on those that give and those that receive. If we kick the weak out of the church, we're going to have an empty church. All are going to fail at some point. All are going to be weak at some point. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3. 
Let's keep reading. And the parts that we think are less honorable, there's an interesting word to think about, we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. The first adjective we hear, see here is less honorable. Honor is usually associated in our mind with someone who deserves it. We honor our combat veterans who served our country to defend the freedoms that we have. But what about the people that we don't think deserve God's love? What about the people that we say, you know, they're a part of the church, but I don't really see them changing. In fact, I would go so far as to say that that person might be an abomination in God's eyes because of their actions and the choices that they're making. And we say that they're less honorable, that they have no honor. But really, at the end of the day, what's too big for God's grace? What's too big for God's love? It tells us that the less honorable are to be treated with special honor. What does that look like? It means that we don't let our own bias or prejudice prevent us from serving one another. In Acts chapter 2, the church sold what they had and they gave to those that were in need. In Matthew 18, it tells us how many times should I forgive my brother? And it gives us a math problem. It tells us in Galatians 6 that if a brother is caught in sin, we who are spiritual should restore them gently. The passage continues on. The next adjective that it uses is unpresentable. Who is unpresentable in the church? Maybe it's that person that you don't really want to be seen with. Maybe they have a bad reputation. Maybe they say or do incredibly awkward things that just make you uncomfortable. Maybe it's the way they smell. I think what it's talking about is a deep brokenness that is not meant to be lived publicly. It's those people who are going through those messy, broken relationships that make for great TV, but don't really make for things that we want to sit down and put on the table to show how great our church is. Maybe it's those marriages that are struggling. Maybe it's that person who addiction just keeps rearing its ugly head in their life. But it tells us that we're to treat that person with special modesty. That it means we use our good reputation to strengthen their name. It's creating a space in the church where it's okay to be broken. That when you lay yourself bare and you confess that brokenness to your church that God provides special modesty for you. It's not something that then explodes out into your community. It's people who make it okay to be broken here with other people that are broken. It's when the people in church recognize that they're a broken sinner just like you and they extend grace, they extend mercy, and they extend forgiveness, that they're willing to walk with you through trial and tribulation. Here's a bonus parable of what that might look like. You raise livestock. You got sheep, cow, whatever it is. When it's storming, you put them in the barn. What happens in the barn? That floor is going to be covered in some awful stuff. It's going to stink. It's going to be messy. Guess what? The church is meant to be a place of shelter in a storm. That means it's going to look messy here. We're going to have people who bring their garbage in, and guess what? 
We brought some garbage in when we came in the door too. And it's hypocritical not to put up with somebody else's garbage when others were willing to put up with ours. And you know who cleans it up? The Good Shepherd. But it's when we choose to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that situation, when we choose to be his voice, when we create the opportunity for special modesty. Here's the one that I think we skim over, verse 24. Those that are presentable. Who is presentable? Maybe it's the person who looks like a Christian. They seem to have their life together. Everything seems to be on track. Maybe it's those spiritual leaders that we have goals of becoming like that person. It's people who look like Jesus, the mature in Christ. It's important to note that they need no special treatment. They don't need special treatment because today they have strength for others to lean on. It's their turn to be Jesus' hands and feet. It's their turn to help ease the burden of someone who's struggling. To put a shoulder under and to take up a load. We may be the presentable person today, but tomorrow we might be weak. We might be less honorable. And we might be unpresentable. But it's our job today not to seek special honors or treatment, but to find those that need our strength in this moment. The last part of this is awesome. Verses 25 through 26 say, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When we allow the head of the church to talk to us about how we interact and treat one another, when we listen to the words of Jesus and allow that to dictate how we treat one another inside the church, whether it be this building or another baptized believer on the other side of the world, it says that we will have less division. We will have less fighting inside our body. It says that when we have equal concern for each other, that all the needs will be met. It tells us what the meaning of family is. It's the meaning that when someone loses a child or goes through a traumatic experience, that the rest of the church mourns with them and feels that pain. It suffers with the pain that they're experiencing. It also means that when you achieve something, we want to rejoice. We do this with our graduates, don't we? We have a day where we allow them to lead, and then at the end, we take a minute to honor what they've accomplished. But it also means that when you have that victory over some spiritual evil in your life, that the church is going to celebrate with you. It means that when something good comes your way, the church is going to celebrate with you because they're happy for you because they're a part of it with you. We are like the Redwoods. We were built to live with others. Like the Redwoods, if we want our faith to keep growing for many, many, many years... We need each other to do that. If we want our faith to reach the highest of heights, we need one another. If we want to be spiritual giants, we're not going to get that living in solitude with God. All of our stories are meant to be intertwined. All of our families are meant to be intertwined. Our heights and our lowest lows are meant to be shared. I want to encourage you, 
If you want to grow tall, if you want to stay long, you must be in the body of Christ. You have to be a part of the church. 2020 has looked different for churches everywhere. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like for you to live in close community that's intertwined and fused with other believers. But I do know this. We, the church at Mesa here, we need you. You at home that are watching, we need you. You that are sitting in this auditorium, we need you. Other believers that have been baptized, we need you need you. I hope there was some encouragement in there for you. I hope there was something that was challenging. In a minute, we're going to sing an invitation song. And if you have a need, there are some elders who would love to talk with you about the messiness that's happening. They'd also love to talk with you about the joys that are going on. If there's something that we as a church can do for and with you. This is your opportunity to come forward as we sing. Every mountain, every sunset sky, but my one